Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And together we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics. So this episode is perhaps my most self-indulgent episode, possibly also our most controversial, and it is about so far. So far, we could have we more. We strive for more in the future on controversy. Yeah. Do we? Oh, we will. I don't think we're very clickbaity. I think we try to be pretty reasonable. Sure. But、uh, th- today's topic is fascism, and it came from two pairs of internet arguments I had, both involving the something awful forums.、Uh, there's a science fiction book called Starship Troopers, and I argue that it was fascist. Did I make you watch the Starship Troopers movie with me, where they fight the bugs? Oh yeah. We did. Yeah. Okay. So, so I had an argument about that, and that caused me to read a bunch of books about. Fascism, because I realize I actually don't really know what fascism is. I know what it looks like、mm. in movies and things like that, but I don't really understand.、Uh, I didn't really understand academically what it was.、Mm. And another argument was、um, somebody was calling China fascist, and I personally. I'm sorry. Was that me? <laughs> no, it was not you. <laughs> it was not you. But.、Uh, And I personally was like, you know, I don't really think China is fascist. The person said, okay, well maybe they're not, but it doesn't matter. Why do you care?、Hmm. And I had to think about that for a while, because <laughs> on the one sense, you know, anybody can see looking at the news today, the Chinese government is not good from a moral perspective. So it doesn't matter if people are calling it fascist or not. Does that claim、mm-hmm. that needs to be challenged?、Hmm. I think you might want to wanted to say many things the Chinese government is doing. Yes, is not good. Is not good. You can't argue for it on a moral per, per, on a moral, moral standpoint. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, you could. There's the famous quote from Deng Xiaoping, which is a、uh, black cat, white cat, as long as it catches mice. Yeah. In in this case, mice is economic growth, and well,、uh, yeah. You know, there is that mentality of like. Well, you know, whatever works. Yeah, whatever works.、Uh, little fascism. Well, to to be <laughs> fair, I think he was saying capitalism. I know. Or socialism with Chinese characteristics. I know. Doesn't matter. I know, but you know. But yeah. Well, in today's lens, it's a. It's a. It、yeah. could be read a different way. So here's my speech. Okay. Any objective observer. So this is、uh, calling out the Fifty Cents party out there. <laughs>、uh, any objective observer can see that the current government of China is an authoritarian and oppressive one. I won't go into the territorial seizures, the cultural reeducations, the labor camps, the propaganda, and the public surveillance. However, for a few years now, detractors of the regime have called it fascist or Chi Nazi. Is the、uh, I've seen that word around. Right, term around. However, is this really accurate? I say this not to defend the Chinese government and not simply as an academic exercise. Fascism is a uniquely terrible form of government. However, pure authoritarianism can be equally bad in its own ways. Non-fascist governments can still put people in death camps, can still have genocides, can still do all sorts of terrible things.、Mm-hmm. Fascism is not the worst. Uniquely bad form of government, right? It's not like saying that if it's not fascist, you're somehow saying it's better.、Mm. I'm just saying it's okay. different, okay? <laughs> But this is for the for our, our dear、so、listeners. This is、decide. not a five cents party episode <laughs> no, right no. here. This is not a five cents party episode, right? Okay. That'll be interesting. If Too we get, bad. We、I、could、know. have collected some. We could have made fifty cents. That'd be our first money we made on this podcast. <laughs> so fascism has unique views that often spill out and destroy those around it. Um, and unlike authoritarianism, it cannot simply be contained. The two times fascist movements seized control of a nation, they destroyed themselves and most of the countries around them in an orgy of violence. So, communism, authoritarianism, monarchism, even religious、um, dictatorships—they—they are not necessarily an existential threat that has to be contained, because. I would say America had thought different. Well, yeah, during the Cold War, exactly right.、Um, <laughs> of communism, yeah, of communism. Just in case if you didn't, but、yeah. you can be a communist country. You can be North Korea, right? Which is a terrible place to live, but it's also contained. Hasn't started anything major for 
And the standard for that would that be? This is a question.、Mm-hmm. Would that be like in World War Two, Japan, Germany, Italy, their expansionism? Yes, that would be a character. Yeah, well, Japan r- is more imperialist. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. But if you're the a fascist, na- well, we'll get into it. We'll get into okay, it. Okay.、Right? Sorry, I jumped the gun. I know. Well, you know. <laughs> but what exactly is fascism, and how does it differ from other forms of totalitarian rule? So, in 1964, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart famously r- ruled that an item under review was was not obscene and not pornographic. American Supreme Court. American Supreme Court. It was like an art film or something. I forget the details, but he's like, it's not porn. And they were like, well, how do you know it's not porn?、Mm. And he said, I know it when I see it. And the motion picture involved in this case is not that, <laughs> and that became like the Supreme Court almost like a precedent, right? Because it's like, well, how do you define something like a naked Greek statue versus a naked woman in a pornographic film having sex with a plumber? You just know, you can just tell, and you just have to judge it on a base by a case by a case, case by case basis, right?、Mm. So today, the word fascist seems to occupy a similar place in most people's minds. Most people would not be able to come up with a concise definition of fascism, but are happy to call this or that thing fascist. Many might not be even aware of the meaning of the word, coming from a symbol of power in Republican Rome and adorning our own U.S. Senate chambers. It eventually became associated with a political movement in Italy under Mussolini after World War One.、Mm. So fascism, it basically comes to etymology. Comes from the Roman fasces, which were these bundles of sticks wrapped around an axe that represented the power of the Roman Republic. In ceremonial situations, they would carry these around the consuls, or kind of like the Roman presidents.、Mm. This is before the emperors. Okay.、Um, and I think it meant that the sticks represented their ability to beat, and the axes to kill anyone. Like when they were on campaign, because they had that power as like the head of the Roman state. Sounds like a very violent center. Well, if you look at the U.S. Senate chambers, there's two giant fasces on either side of the,、um, like the speaker's podium. Oh, right. You can see they're huge. I never noticed. Yeah, because、okay. it came from well, and they probably predate fascism.、Mm. So they probably put them up there like in the 1800s or something. Yeah. So similar movements sprung up all over Europe with their own goals and symbols, but all vaguely coexisting under the banner of fascism.、Uh, how do you form a common definition of such wildly different movements, half of which would have put the other half in death camps if they'd had the opportunity? How do you detect such a movement in our present day? This is not a new problem. People have been struggling with this issue since the movement started in the early 1920s. We're going to explore four different definitions of fascism to see if the modern Chinese government or past Chinese governments, like the KMT,、uh, fit the criteria. Okay. So first definition: Marxist fascism, as the Italian political movement, was founded in 1919 by Benito Mussolini.、Uh, from the very beginning, it found itself in conflict with communist groups in Italy. Both movements were similar in some ways. They attracted unsatisfied young people and radicalized them. They railed against the corruption of the state and they advocated for violent change. Given that in some ways they were competing for the same quote-unquote resources in essentially young. Angry people、okay. who thought that the so I mean this is、uh, World War One was terrible in some ways it was more terrible or traumatizing than World War Two because everybody really felt like they lost、mm. nobody really felt like they won you know millions of people had died on all sides in a certain way everybody was like why did we do this everybody essentially blamed. Their governments,、mm. from France to Germany, you know, they thought they'd been betrayed. England, even the United States, thought, "Why did we send all those people to die in a European war?" And Italy is the same way. And a lot of these soldiers felt after the war was over that they had been abandoned, and that they had fought this war, and now the country, you know, essentially did not care about them. So, given in some ways that they were competing for the same resources, Marxists in Italy and abroad tried to make sense of this new movement and fit it into their revolutionary framework. While individual opinions can differ, on the whole, certain trends emerged. If communism is revolutionary, an outpouring of violence to right class inequality, fascism, from the Marxist viewpoint, is inherently reactionary.、Mm. Seeing their grip on power weaken, bourgeoisie forces either create or appropriate fascism as a potent force to keep themselves in power. So, in the kind of classical Marxist definition, fascism. 
comes from the revolution is starting to succeed, right? Communism is building, class consciousness is building, and the bourgeoisie essentially go like, all right, the mask is off. So in defense, they're doing... Yes. They're pushing to the extreme. Yes, because in the end, you know, the whole point of capitalism or the whole in the Marxist idea, capitalism only works because the working class has not yet fully awoken. So the so the the capitalist class, the bourgeoisie class doesn't necessarily have to have all these authoritarian measures mm, okay. because the people are kind of like sheep. But once they're awoken, they're like, all right, the game is up. Now it's not just like economic domination of the lower classes. Now it's like literal domination of the lower classes through, mm, okay. you know, through secret police, through dictatorship, through propaganda, through societal control. And there's different ways of looking at it. Some think that um, the bourgeoisie create fascism, essentially. Okay. And some say they just appropriate it. They realize what's happening and they get ahead of it and mm. they ally with them. Okay. Um, so when the legal means to subdue the revolution have failed, the bourgeoisie will turn to extrajudicial forces, such as the black or brown shirts, which were this, this kind of secret or, uh, political gangs for the Nazis and the fascists. Mm. Um, in this way, fascism is simply one of the ugliest and most desperate results of fas- of capitalism, not a unique political system. Hmm. Okay. Capitalism to its extreme. If it, if the revolution has not succeeded yet or it, it fails then that's that's what you get almost basically that's is, so is... interesting because from the communist lens mm-hmm. from a communism from a communist's lens yeah fascism a bit, a capitalism is the ultimate evil right essentially yeah. essentially in, fr- fr- in that frame of thinking mm-hmm. and fascism allies itself with capitalism mm-hmm. or in a way it's almost saying that it's a symptom of capitalism yes so but today, obviously, we're talking in the frames of we're talking about it. We're discussing it on the frames of Chinese American relationships. Yes. And, and we, you know, we, we're living in America. So we talk about American politics a lot. Mm-hmm. And obviously, in the 20th, late 20th century and early 21st century, mm-hmm. capitalism is a force of freedom as claimed <laughs> by America. Yes. So that's, you know, it really is whatever you call it in a way. Yeah, I think that is a thing, though. It's like where we see it, and again, we'll talk about this in other definitions, but fascism is largely seen as a completely unique political situation in the West. Because again, Marxism, I'm not a Marxist scholar, so (laughs) take this with a grain of salt, but Marxism essentially believes things like democracy. It's just frim-fram. Mm. Like, that doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. If, if, if 1% of the people have 99% of the wealth, it doesn't matter if people can vote, right? It, they still don't have any power, mm. right, from a Marxist lens. It's like that's just window dressing on capitalism. Mm. And so if so that's... So you have to have a democracy of, of the pro, Of the proletariat, yeah. right? You have to have the means of production. Yeah. If the means of productions aren't spread out, it doesn't matter if votes are spread out. Mm. So from that perspective, yeah, it's just an, it's an outgrowth of capitalism in its, in its ugliest form. Okay. Um, so many other aspects of fascism are interpreted differently through this lens. Uh, the constant wars are to create new markets. The persecution of the left is to destroy things like labor unions. And the cult of the will is familiar to anyone who has had to attend a motivational work meeting. While I don't want to overgeneralize, many fascist groups and marches today are aligned with the far left and tend to see fascism as an evil of capitalism. So groups like Antifa are usually... And again, it's not like they're this coherent dragon, but people who, as a whole, that group in Europe and the United States is also anti-capitalism and mm. is fairly firmly aligned with com- with communist groups. Mm. Um, so they are anti-fascist. Uh, I'm not saying they're not, but I am saying that they also, a lot of them, don't really believe in liberal democracy either, in that, you know, it's still... They need to get to communism. So um, from this Marxist perspective, I think that it's pretty clear that current China is not fascist from from a Marxist perspective. No. Um, it is capitalist, right? Yes. But there's no threat. The closest you could say to a threat of another revolution would be like the cultural revolution, 
Um, but that was never stopped by like street gangs and violence. No, no it's basically just kind of burnt out. Well, it was stopped by the death of <laughs> Mao, Mao essentially. and essentially a coup was yeah. in the was in the you know party in charge. Yeah, in power. So from from a Marxist perspective, I think, and I'm not going to go too far into it because again, the the Marxist perspective of fascism is, I think, fairly static throughout the years. Of like, this is where it comes from. It comes from capitalism. Mm. If China is com- fascist, it's not fascist from a Marxist perspective because there, you know, there's no counter-revolution. There is no anything. Um, no. So that's the Marxist perspective or one Marxist perspective. Marxists all hate each other and are <laughs> very fragmented, right? So, yeah. um, so the, the next one is the classic liberal approach. So there's an old internet meme that suggests an amateur science experiment. How much sawdust can you put in a Rice Krispie treat before someone notices? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and actually, this guy, um, iDubbbz, did it. And it turns out you can put about, I think, about 30% sawdust in a Rice Krispie treat. Literally. Before somebody realizes there's sawdust in there. If you don't tell them, right? Wow. They might just think this is a weird tasting Rice Krispie treat. Mm. But they won't think there's sawdust. Okay. Fascism is a nebulous thing. And it's the sawdust in this analogy. How much fascism can you sprinkle in something before you recognize it's fascism? Ah, okay. Right? All right. So um, it creeps in. It, it's it, a gradual like thing. It, in the classical, uh, in this kind of classical definition, which was people after World War II, yeah. essentially trying to make sense of it. It's like, well, okay, they wear the uniforms, they do the marches, they do all these things. And it's like, okay, well, other groups do those things too. So it's like, well, how much of all these things does Where- a group have to do before it's fascist, right? So where do you draw? Where do you draw the line? Yes. When do you say this is now fascism? Yeah, because Boy Scouts were fat, were <laughs> uniforms, right? <laughs> yes. Many of the classic approaches to fascism involve identifying certain core elements that, if in high enough concentration, indicate fascism. So uh, the person I'm choosing to use as a reference is somebody named Umberto Eco, okay. who is an Italian writer and political philosopher and essayist who was born in 1932 and lived through the height of fascist Italy. Mm. In 1995, he wrote the essay Ur Fascism, which attempts to define the qualities of a fascist regime. 1995? In 1995, yeah. Okay, so it had settled down a bit. He's thought about it. He'd had time to think about it. Okay. Um, A movement uh, attempted to define the qualities of a fascist regime. A movement does not need to meet every requirement in order to be fascist from his perspective, but it cannot be fascist without meeting at least one. Okay. Uh, On the whole, this approach is emblematic of the traditional approach to fascist studies. Um, Fascists believe certain things. They have certain worldview. There's certain things, you know, you can tell a bird by the color of its feathers, essentially. So here are the 14 points that he put in his thing. Okay. Um, And we'll go through them and we'll talk about China. So the first one is the cult of tradition. So this is common to almost all. And you'll notice a lot of these can be applied to a lot of groups. Okay. That we wouldn't necessarily consider fascism. So this is one of the the problems with this approach is that, well, how many things do you have to do to be fascist, right? And everybody's Mm going to disagree. So cult of tradition. This is common to almost all totalitarian movements. All major political and philosophical questions have already been answered. All that is left is to interpret them. For example, marriage is between a man and a woman. Mm. There's no need to reinvestigate this. There's no need to think about it. That's just what marriage is. And that's what that question has been decided, right? Children should obey their parents. Classical music is the best. Germans, you know, are, you know, a place of the woman is in the home. Things like that. So if a country or a political body or a society refuses to challenge these statements. Yes. Then that's one of the points that you that's could one do. of the points. Okay, got it. So culture of tradition, that's debatable in China, right? Because lots of things are, but marriage and stuff like that, you know, those aren't seen as questions to be challenged in mainland China. Not, no, not, not the role by any broad. Of, the role of a man culture. and a woman, deference to authority, you know, obedience to the state. Um, yeah, definitely not obedience to the state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would say, yeah. So China has a culture of tradition. Well, at least it does now, not after Mao. (laughs) Yes. It didn't for a while, but... uh, Okay, so number two is rejection of modernity. In particular, modern forms of government, society, and art. 
for example, jazz, democracy, free market capitalism, communism. Hmm. So I would say China does not have this in that yeah. they reject certain things, but art, for example, the Nazis very famously had good art and bad art and they had oh. like a museum of degenerate art right where you could go and see jazz music and like cubist paintings and they go like yeah this is crap <laughs> well in the official sort of narrative mm -hmm. there is a very you know simplified understanding of art and, and literature and all that because it's easier to control mm -hmm. however i wouldn't say it has yeah it doesn't have a strict definition of what's a better art yeah and what's a worse art yeah, and Unless it's, it's art of dissent. Yes, right. That's <laughs> so, that's rejected. Yeah. Um, so number three is a cult of action, which is action for action's sake. Do before thinking. Thinking is weak. Fascist nation, you know, there's a problem like, oh, you know, we um, don't have enough, you know, food. And then they would just start doing something, even if in the end it's counterproductive, right? Some cockamamie scheme to reorganize something, yeah. to boost production. Just do it. And yeah. thinking about things and talking and having committees is for weak, inefficient, you know, bureaucratic. That's interesting because the older Mao's China is yeah. more that. Yeah, Mao's China is very China. much cult of the will. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, well, not cult of will, but cult of action because, and that's one of the, pro oopsies. Maybe let's stop punching the microphone. Okay. <laughs> and that's one of the problems with these definitions. They, they can be applied to lots of stuff. And it's all on a scale. Right. Yeah. So Mao was obviously very cult of action. Chinese emperors very much cult of action. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I would say today's China is pretty cult of action if we compare it to other political bodies or countries in the world. In like Wuhan, where they're like, "Oh, there's a virus. We'll build a city. hospital in five days. Oh, seal yes. off the city. Just yes. do stuff." Yes. Yeah. Um, but still, if you compare it to like 50 years ago, then yes, not even. <laughs> yeah, 50 years ago in so. Mao's China, like this stuff moves at a snail's pace. Um, so huh? number. Number four. They didn't move us. They they moved at very fast pace. Who did? Fifty years ago in China. I'm saying compared to fifty years ago. Oh, today, today we moved yeah. at yeah. Well, yeah. So number four is dissent is betrayal. So sim. Uh, so critique or disagreement is seen as disharmonious at best, treason or sabotage at worst. That's a hard yes for China today. Yes, right. <laughs> Where yeah. you go like, okay, this is what we're gonna do, and yeah. then the leader comes out and goes, boom, we're gonna do this plan, and somebody goes. That's not going to work. And then you go, like, that's because you're uh, a traitor, right? Essentially, right? And you're yeah. going to get, you're going to get sacked. You're going to get in trouble. This is treason. This is treason. <laughs> and yeah, that's been true. I think of China for 5,000 years more, <laughs> more or less, right? Yes. China's never been big on naysayers. So I don't think that's a new mm -hmm. fascist thing. Yes. And I'm sorry. I was laughing throughout this process. I just realized this, this is a very serious discussion. <laughs> it is a serious <laughs> discussion, but so that's number four. Mm. Number five is fear of difference built upon a fear of intruders. These can be foreign or within society itself. This makes a fascism inherently uh, racist or bigoted. Mm. So, you know, in Germany, it's the Jews. In Italy, it's various ethnic groups um, or the, the Bolsheviks, right? The communists. This, again, this is partially true in, in China, I think, today. Um, yeah, I would say that. I mean, and that's part of all of the re-education camps and all the stuff with Uyghurs and in Inner Mongolia and places like that. Yeah, forbidden schools in in um, Inner Mongolia to teach a different language. Yes. Yeah, it's all because of that. Number six is appeal to the frustrated middle class. In a general sense, fascism appeals to groups experiencing economic shock, humiliation, or pressure from below. Mm. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the middle class or any group is actually losing anything. Mm. It could be that another group is coming up to join them mm. and they feel like they're losing their privileged position. I don't think that's China. No, right? China is you know, trying to build a middle class, you know what I mean? There's no established middle class that is big enough, <laughs> big enough to be, to be worried. Yeah. So number seven is obsession with conspiracies. Fascism gives people a coherent identity, but the most important part of that is an enemy to fight where one does not exist. It must be created from within or for without, for example, Jewish conspiracies or the modern QAnon movement in mm. the United States. Okay. Uh, you know, there has to be some nebulous conspiracy that you're fighting against. You can never really win so that there's always an enemy. I don't think China really has that today. Chinese people well, love, I mean, everybody loves conspiracies, but like. 
Yeah. Also, I would say, I mean, obviously, for example, in today's China, mm -hmm. America is a is is the enemy who's always trying to take us down. I think actually, in a way, China is very much not this because I think after the Cultural Revolution,、mm -hmm. they became very concerned about stuff getting out of hand,、mm. about about conspiracies and and sort of like memes and thoughts. Right. For example, for the longest time. If you sold a video game in China, you weren't allowed to have skeletons in it,、mm. or like magic, because they just you weren't allowed to have superstition. Yeah, because they they just don't want these beliefs going around that、yeah. don't have a basis. Because once they get out, you can't control them anymore. Yes, no, now I think about it because it's sometimes consp conspiracy is a symptom of a society where there is no freedom of speech, where there is no. Yeah. Where, where, where? Oh, sorry. Where there is no transparency,、mm. not freedom of speech. When there, when there, there's no transparency. So, the government oftentimes will censor conspiracies、mm. just because they don't want any theories out there, let alone be true or not, because、yeah. that instills、um, cha chaos into the system. Yeah, I mean, in, in China, again, we'll talk about fascism. As much as it seems like order, it's really. It, Doesn't want order. Fascism,、mm -hmm. in a way, is kind of a permanent revolution in the same way that <laughs> the Cultural Revolution was. Right? right. You're constantly churning. You're constantly everybody's、right. angry, afraid,、mm -hmm. fearful. You know, violent.、Mm. Um, and that's the energy you use to start wars, <laughs> essentially. Right.、Um, uh, number eight. Enemies are at once too strong and too weak.、Uh, they may be. The classic example of this is. Jewish people in like Nazi conspiracies. Yeah. Of、uh, they control the world. They have all the money. They do everything. But we can beat them, right? Yeah. <laughs> they may be rich, well fed, and powerful, but they are also cowardly, weak, and defeatable. Yes, I would say that's a yes for China. <laughs> <laughs> so who would the enemies in the be in this case? I mean, the West, America, like America, right? Yeah, America. If you, I think we talked about before in you know, in chi Chinese media,、mm -hmm. America is on fire all the time. Yeah. Right. It's a it's a terrible society. It's very chaotic. You know, cities are burning down. The capital city, the capital building is、yeah, being burned、exactly. down. But at the same time, at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> they're our worst enemy in the world. Yeah. And we gotta really look out for them. And we're poor little China, and、yeah. we're just you know they're bullying us. Sides, we're being bullied. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's exactly right. I mean, and for example. This isn't a necessarily fascist thing, but like Japan thought that of the United States, right? Germany thought that of all these other countries in Europe. Oh,、well, they're bullying us. They're so they're cruel. You、they、just named、everything. two countries that are actually seen was recognized as fascism. Well, Germany was.、Uh, Japan wasn't fascist. Oh, in Chinese definition. I, well, we'll we'll talk about <laughs> yeah, that, okay. right? Yeah.、Um, by the Western definition, Japan had fascist elements. But in the end, it was just kind of like an authoritarian, imperialist nation.、Mm. Um, they just were fifty years too late to the party. Right. Nobody, you, you weren't allowed to be imperialist anymore. So sorry, I'm slow on this. So basically, we're really talking about Germany and Italy. Those well, are the two official well,、so、fascism. Fascism officially is Italian because、yeah. it was the fascist party. Right. That's where the name came from. But and then there's other groups that share the same DNA, and that's kind of fascism as a general term.、Mm, so、okay. the the two there's three recognizable. Ones there's there's、uh, that actually took over a nation as a fascist party. So one is obviously Germany,、mm. one is Italy, and I think the other one's Romania, but it wasn't for very long.、Mm. There's other fascist groups, like for example in uh, Spain, uh, General Franco and the, the Spanish Civil War, which was a big thing before World War II,、mm. had a lot of fascist elements. Okay, but in the end, those kind of Did not fully come to the forefront. They stayed out of World War II. Eventually, they kind of organically became less fascist.、Mm. And there's been fascist groups in lots of places, but they, like for example, in Greece, there was the Golden Dawn recently. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they were a fascist political party. They got banned after. No, but it's a funny name. Yeah, and they were very powerful for a while. Okay. And they're anti-immigrant, and they're, they they were fascist, but they never. Gain control of the government. Right. So、um, life is struggle. Pacifism is incompatible with fascism, as a fascist society is in a state of permanent war,、mm. either with external enemies or with internal problems. If they are not at war, they are preparing for one. The end of this struggle will theoretically be a time of eternal peace. We just gotta, you know, 
you know, win this war, do whatever, defeat this enemy, and then everything is going to be great afterwards, right? Right. We just got to make America great again, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, elitism. So oh. aren't you happy that you don't have to call America? Not to date ourselves. I know. Today, you don't have to <laughs> I know. use that as right. say, America. We have to check that. I know. Yeah. Um, lighten up. Lighten up. It's no I know. Longer. This is, I just I got depressed thinking about Donald <laughs> Trump. Okay, so we're going to talk more about Donald Trump at the end. Oh, okay. we are? Oh, yeah. Don't oh, worry. Oh, cool. Okay. We, this, you know, if... How could we not? <laughs> how could we not? We got to get our check from the 50 cents party by saying bad things about the United States. Um, elitism. <laughs> All true members of a fascist society belong to an elite. The best people, the best nation, the best party. And that's just inherently, right? Mm, okay. You're not the elite of the society. You, as being part of the society and the race, are inherently elite. Mm. Right? If you're the poorest person in Germany, you're still a German. If you're in Italy in World War II, you're a member of the new Roman Empire. Mm, okay, so I would say almost a yes, because that's tied to nationalism. Yes. That's tied to as long as you're part of this country and the country's strong, mm -hmm. that you are glorious exactly, as well. Exactly, right? You're glorious through the results of that. You're, yeah. you're part of a, a larger whole. Yeah. So the leader is well aware that his power has not been obtained by delegation, but by force. He also knows that his power is based on the weakness of the masses who are so weak to deserve and need a dictator. So on the one hand, you're part of the elite. Yeah. But on the other hand cynically mm -hmm. from the perspective of the actual ruling elite of that society your sheep your child because otherwise they wouldn't be in charge yeah, yeah right yeah. you need someone else to be in charge of you yes so uh everyone is a hero everyone yearns to die the greatest reward <laughs> for fascism is a heroic death to sacrifice their life for a cause mm. and the famous quote is um is that the fascist hero is in a hurry to die and in his hurry to die he typically causes those around him to die mm, okay. um so you're you know you're raised to be a martyr to die for the people of the state that's i don't know if that's china that was like maoist china yeah, yeah, yeah modern yeah. china they don't want anybody to be a martyr they just want everybody to be quiet and not cause trouble yeah this yearn to be a hero and warrior translates into sexual matters. However, since sex and relationships can be difficult, this sexuality bleeds back into the military. The ur fascist hero plays with weapons, yeah. which are his ersatz penis, <laughs> which is the direct quote from it, right? Okay. So there's this sort of gay, homoerotic sexuality, right? With have uniforms seen, in the march. Have you seen Chinese uh, Soviet Union brotherhood posters <laughs> propaganda yeah. posters yes those are very <laughs> so like you know suggestive <laughs> you know the, the the line of missiles going down in the parade all yeah. sticking up right that's yes. like mm -hmm. so you are you're a man because um of your power of it isn't that how like weapons ultra masculinity is like, linked to this image right yeah Next is representative government is inefficient and true power comes from the quote unquote will of the people. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Which, <laughs> That's too many. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is interpreted uh, by a supreme leader. If the elected government does not agree, it is invalid and does not represent the will of the people. So again. That's like party line right well, there. I mean, that's again, the Donald Trump election thing, yeah. right? It's like, oh, well. When I, how could I not be president when my video got 3 million YouTube likes? Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Or, or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Isn't that how a democracy works? Well, it is. Or that's how it's supposed to work. Yeah. Not, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm that, I'm, I was being oh, sarcastic. Oh, okay. Well, I meant democracy works as in like, it doesn't matter how people feel. It matters how the votes turn out. Oh, well, yes. Um, so an interesting, there's a quote, and I'm not sure if this is from the original essay, because the, the one I read is, was a later printing. Mm-hmm said, in our future, there looms qualitative TV or internet populism in which the emotional response of a selected group of citizens can be presented and accepted as the voice of the people. Mm. So again, you go like, like Donald Trump, like how can, you know, I get this many YouTube likes, right? Everybody retweets my tweets, right? How could I not? Look at my rallies. That's Look the voice rallies. of the people. Yes. Yeah. And again, I think that, I mean, China does not have representative government. And so it's not really concerned about the will of the people. No. Right? I mean, I think they, they claim that's where their authority comes from. Yeah. But, but not in reality. But They're they don't not need responsible to for the Yeah, they the don't need people. to prove it. Yeah. And then the last is uses new speak, which is a Orwellian term from 1984. Language with a limited vocabulary that eliminates nuance. Mm. 
simplistic language is helpful to a fascist as it limits the ability of those to critically reason because you need the words to describe yeah what's going what's going on right? yeah i i would say that's a yes unfortunately in in china today yeah in the chinese language so i think if you look we we kind of talked about these 14 points china meets some of them you know um lots of authoritarian governments that we would not call fascism yeah meet some of them yeah Lots of non-authoritarian government kind of meet some of yes, them. Yes, could meet some yeah. of them, right? <laughs> By this definition, your mileage may vary on whether or not you think China is fascist. And he's not, Umberto Eco is not the end-all and be-all hmm. of this definition. He's one that's quoted a lot because he's, it's, it's easy to understand, um, but he's kind of emblematic of this view. Okay. So, so so far, two two brands of theories yes. about how, what the fascism what is. What fascism is. The China doesn't really... Doesn't fully meet either of them. Yeah. Well, the second one, definitely It more. meets some of the qualifications. Many of, I would yeah. say. <laughs> Many yeah. of, right? And yeah. again, you don't have to meet all of them. Yeah. So whether or not it meets enough, that's up to the listener, right? Mm -hmm. um, I personally think that... It's it, not enough. It's not enough. It mm -hmm. doesn't meet any more than any other of a bunch of other authoritarian russia you know well right i mean is saudi arabia mm. fascist <laughs> um you know is north korea maybe right north but Korea's got to be more fascist well on that scale on that scale right than china probably yeah i don't really know enough about north korea because they don't broadcast their <laughs> inner business like china does yeah, right that's true um so but it's complicated yeah so next, so now we're going to talk about the empathetic or the sympathetic, maybe not, not sympathetic, empathetic. Okay. Just, I was just, I was raising uh, my eyebrows. So in yeah. the classic approach, liberal approach, uh -huh. fascism is in some ways a black box. It can be known by its outputs. Okay. The wars it generates, the propaganda speeches it makes, the books it burns, but the mind of a fascist is in some ways inscrutable. Mm. You cannot trust what they say they believe because after all they're fascists and fascists lie so because you can't trust their stuff you kind of just have to look at the result okay because fascists can say we're pro-worker right we're you know whatever just like china is. just like china <laughs> right oh you know we're for the environment and it's like but then they go and they start wars and they do these things right yeah um for example very famously uh in, in germany the nazis were pro-worker, pro-environment, pro-reform, all these social things, mm. only if you were German. Yeah. But they still, on paper, supported those things. Yeah. So you don't want to call those things fascist because they're good things, yeah. not just for Germans, but for, for everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, scholars became increasingly unsatisfied with this approach. I'll say some scholars. Um, and a renewed effort to crack the black box and examine the algorithm of fascism mm. began. Within the last 40 years, a new approach to fascist studies began to take hold. While there are multiple ways to define it, I like the term empathetic, despite the troubling connotations. Okay. Empathy is, un you know, to understand. Yeah. Not necessarily to sympathize with mm -hmm. um, or to agree with, but to get into the head a little bit of the person and try, and, and under try to understand what they think they think they're doing. Okay. Um, this is in some ways an attempt to define fascism and understand it like any other political movement, not as the ultimate aberration of politics it is sometimes treated as. This can be uncomfortable. Also remember that this definition is of generic fascism, not Nazism. Mm, okay. Though Nazism also fits under this definition. Right. But it's easier to be more empathetic. Yes. If you think of it as the generic fascism yes. rather than the very specific <laughs> brand of Nazi, of Nazi fascism. fascism. And also, um, this, doesn't, this doesn't invalidate something like Umberto Eco in that fascist regimes may all, if they stay around long enough, grow to exhibit all of those points. Mm -hmm. But this is just saying from a nucleus, you know, even if it's a party of 20 people, yeah. you can look at it and say like, this is a small party of fascists. This is a small party of fascists, right? Okay. Even if they're not violent, even if you know, nothing else. Right. So I'm going to go with Roger Griffin's definition, uh, who's written a lot of books on it, is considered sort of a leader in this modern field of scholarship about fascism. Okay. So in his 1991 book, The Nature of Fascism, Roger Griffin designed fascism as this. Fascism is a genus of political ideology whose mythic core in its various permutations is a palingenetic form 
of populist ultranationalism. Mm. So let's unpack that. <laughs> okay, in steps, because that's a very wordy sentence. Yeah. Fascism is a genus of political ideology whose mythic core in its various permutations is a palagenetic form of populist ultranationalism. So fascism is a genus of political ideology. Mm -hmm. Genus is a biological term about evolution and species and how different things. Okay. So okay. fascism is a type of political ideology like democracy, communism, or monarchism. Okay. Um, it's not an aberration or somehow apolitical. It's just another type of politics. Of politics. All real world of fascism can draw lineage to an ideal type, similar to how the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of China can both be recognizably communist, mm. though both had variations from the ideal. Mm. So this is the sort of platonic ideal of fascism, um, of like everything is a reflection of that. Yeah. So mythic core. All fascist movements have a core utopian myth of an ideal status of society and civilization. Hmm. The core myth is that a group of people form an ultranation, and that ultranation is in crisis and needs to be saved from a present state of disintegration and decadence hmm. through the agency of a vanguard made up of those awakened to the threat and willing to fight it. Technically, this fight does not have to be physical. Um, it's like, like, so basically, it's like we're... I'm, again, I'm going to use Donald Trump's, right? So for okay. this part of it, like, we're Americans. Mm -hmm. We're real Americans. But America is in trouble, Cherry. Yeah. And not everybody realizes it. They're all asleep, you know, but they're got, the government's corrupt. You know, politicians don't care about you. You know, they're taking away our rights. Yeah. But we realize, Cherry, you and me. <laughs> yeah. We realize what's happening. Yeah. And so does Donald Trump. <laughs> And we have to fight it. So we're going to save America. We have to save America, right? And we're willing to fight for it. Yeah. Well, this is making me feel I'm very uneasy. <laughs> yeah. Just like you said. Because one thing, though, I don't know if that's how it's supposed to make me feel. Yeah. But just to step back, take a step back, yeah. where he said, you know, this is just one brand of politics. Yeah. Just one branch of policies that could be grouped together. Yeah. That means it's on the same stage as all the other policies and yeah. the trends. And anyone can just pick and choose characteristics of fascism and utilize it. Yeah. And that means we're all so close to it. Does that make sense? It's so accessible, it sounds like. No, it is. And right? Then going to the example you said. Yeah. But the idea that society is in trouble, there's, you know, it needs to get to a certain place. We yeah. have an image of it. But that's everyone in a democracy. That's everyone who votes for something. Well, let me let me finish the definition. Okay. Sorry. Because this is half of it, okay. right? Okay. So this is only half of it so far. The final bit is the palagenetic ultranationalism, which is palagenesis is Greek for again and birth. In this context of fascism, it refers to an imminent rebirth of the nation brought about by populist energies. This will usher in a new revolutionary order. This rebirth is informed by the past in important ways. It is not fully modern or forward thinking like communism. Mm. It is also not reactionary in the way the Marxist definition supposes. Fascists also wish for a revolution, just not the same one. Mm, okay. So, for example, you have to believe that in some way you're trying to, to get back or to gain inspiration from a purer time mm, okay. and you form a revolution against the society that is in crisis in your mind to okay. bring it back to, not necessarily to bring it back to, but to form a new society that is based on the principles of that the old That you believe one, in. That you believe. For example, in in Rome, it's it doesn't make as much sense. In, it's it's harder to explain in Germany, but like in, in Mussolini, right? It was supposed to be the new Roman Empire. Mm. So Rome was great. It was the envy of the world. It was the, you know, cradle of you know we think of like western civilization in a way we along with greece mm -hmm. did all these things that was architecture aqueducts and then you look at italy in the 1920s can't really get its act together in the terms now it's a, a second rate power mm -hmm. compared to like france or england or germany mm -hmm. well why are we in this situation you know we need to have a revolution form a new society and it needs to be informed by and and in certain ways based upon the energies of Rome. Mm. Not that we want to go back to Rome, but we want to form a new society that is to 
the world today mm. what Rome was to the world 2,000 years ago. Okay. So make America great again, right? There's this mythical image of, I guess, I don't know, what, 1950s America or something? <laughs> yes. Maybe Ronald Reagan. I don't know what the, what these people think. But yeah. <laughs> there's this, We're you know, just guessing here. We're, yeah, we're this, a time when America was great. <laughs> mm-hmm. And not necessarily that you want to literally go back to that time, but you want to violently overthrow society and um, reach that time. Now, I wouldn't say that's what the entirety of the the Trumpist movement was. Mm. I think when you combine it with the whole stop the steal thing, that's when you get to like fascist Mm. violence, right? Right. Yeah. Because at that point, now you have the crisis, right? Now, now you have to fight. Now's the time. Now's the time, right? Now you have to to fight in the street to make America great again and stop the steal. You have to meet the challenge in your head. And that's, in my opinion, where very clearly the, these, these core of a lot of these the Trump campaign beliefs basically became fascist. Right. Um, and we saw what happened, right? Yeah. But or by you, that definition, coming back to China, yes. this is still a... You know. Still a Chinese history podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, China's not that. No, China's not that. There's no street... There's no fights in the streets. There's no... I mean, there's a, there, there's a national propaganda of return the glory of the Chinese nation. Because the key... But that's different than... Yeah, because the key yeah. element of it yeah. is that it has to be populist. Yes. Right? It can't be the government forming propaganda and, mm-hmm. you know, having troops and secret police and stuff. Yeah. That's what it can result in once the fascists get into power. Mm. But at its start, at its core, it has to be like, we're the people. Yeah. We're the awakened people. We realize what's wrong. Well, and China really true. tries to clamp down on that this stuff. This would be true for China if every five cents party out there <laughs> actually do do what they say, do mean what they say, and 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 taking take action and join the military. Well, and they don't, so well, it's all just shouting. Well, and also yeah. though, but it has to be revolutionary. So yes. you have to believe that the current Chinese government, yeah, is not is not needs to be overturned. It needs to be overturned. <laughs> yeah, you could argue like, well, well, when has that happened in Chinese society? Sun Yat-sen, but no, not really. He doesn't believe in any of this other stuff. He believed that you needed to have essentially a nationalist revolution. Yeah. But it was much more modern, right? It was forward thinking. It wasn't like we need to go back to a good imperial dynasty. Oh, no. We need to get rid of imperial dynasties, right? Yes. And uh, Xi Jinping, you could maybe argue that he staged a coup, a soft coup, in order to take control of the party as thoroughly as he has done. Mm, you mean past- all the anti-corruption campaigns? Yes. And, yeah. But again, that's not that's not populist, right? That's not. No. Also, in a way, though, it's almost like he was given the power to do so. Is that a coup? Like, you know what I mean? Is that just part of the things he's expected and allowed to do by the structure? In a way, so. <laughs> so there's probably fascist movements in China. I'm sure there's groups who. There's probably fascist movements everywhere. Yeah, there's fascist movements yeah. everywhere who believe were the chosen people yeah. to an extent. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be an individual race. Mm. For example, Italian fascism was more multi-ethnic because the Roman Empire was multi-ethnic. Mm. But it didn't include everyone. There were still <laughs> people who were outside yeah. the multi-ethnic um, situation. It could include more than one race. It could include more than one race. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, you have to... You have to have a limit because you do have to define who is and who isn't. Because oh, yeah. If you, you, don't define, ha- you only define a line by who says who's out. Who's out of it, right? Yeah. Um, and I just, I don't think by this kind of modern definition, China, is China right. fits it at all. Mm, okay. Um, so this, this definition is more clear than the liberal approach um, because it's something kind of is or it isn't, right? It, if either it has this core of people yeah. who believe this thing or it doesn't and, and China doesn't. So by this definition, I think it's pretty clear that China is not fascist. Okay. Uh, or at least the government of China is not fascist. It's not a fascist government. It's not a fascist government. That doesn't mean it's so good. So one day if we get, you know, into trouble, we'll just cut that line. Submit <laughs> yeah. it to the Chinese government. <laughs> exactly. See? Yeah. Um, so just for example, a authoritarian dictatorship with death camps and propaganda yeah. is not necessarily fascist. And a peaceful political movement mm. might be. Yeah. Though that doesn't mean the politi- peaceful political movement is going to stay peaceful. Right. Um, so, Cherry, what was the official Chinese Communist Party's definition of fascism? Okay, so I couldn't find specific, like, this is what we Chinese people think fascism is. Okay. But I could find a lot of material about 
fascism because every year we do a we celebrate the party celebrates the the anniversary of the worldwide anti-fascism movement.、Hmm. Basically, World War Two. We we celebrate the end of World War Two. <laughs>、yeah. That's what fascism is. China, China. helped. Yes. So all of these will mention that fascism. It will group Japan, Italy, and Germany together as the face of fascism. Okay. Okay. It's all simple simplified. They're all that's that's who fascism is. That's what fascists do, and the definition, the closest to the party's definition or or the official def- definition I can find of what they were fighting in this war to yes defeat fascism. So, yes, it came from an article posted on the people the people dot cn,、um, a discussion of journalism system of fascism. Okay. Okay, and it's a commentary piece of what、um, you know in World War Two, how did journalism、um, aid in fascism? Okay. From a Chinese perspective, and it, in it it says that five there are five characteristics of fascism. Okay, so this is sort of like the definition two. Yes, yeah,、okay. but there are five of them. So the f- number one is nationalism. Okay, China checks that box. Yes, and it thinks <laughs> that and it thinks that fascism、um, is opposed to the democratic、um, th- uh, democratic theory that、um, people are the owner of the country. Okay. Owner of the country, 人民是国家的主人 You know, people own the country. Okay, to power to the people, and、um, it fascism suggests that the nation is above all. Okay, yeah. So that's yeah, that is. I mean, that's kind of a classical like, you are a cog in、yeah. the nation, right? Yes, right.、Okay. So, you know, in the Chinese system where you know only only Germany and Japan and Italy is is fascism,、mm-hmm. you know, it argues that you know obviously Germany was. Japan,、yeah. Japan was. It doesn't even mention Italy because I guess it's a smaller, <laughs> smaller fish to catch at this point. So by that, so number one,、mm-hmm. I'd say China's nationalist. It does not believe that power. I mean, on paper, it does. On paper, we do. But not in reality. <laughs> Are you saying is that a no comment face? I'm agreeing with you,、okay. but yeah, obvious. That's obvious. So, <laughs> <laughs> so、um, and the second one is the cult of personality of the leader of the country. Okay. Of the Fumer, Führer, Führer of、okay. the Führer. It's that's that's Germany for、mm. leader,、um, A.K.A. Hitler. Okay. And、um, you know, today there is in China. <laughs>、yeah. I would say maybe not ten years ago. Ten、yeah. years ago was the it was the cult of the nine people committee, but、mm. <laughs> today it is the cult of the president. So Mao, there was definitely cult of personality. Oh God, yes. But Mao definitely didn't fit number one, right? He believed that the power was with the people and him and him,、yeah. right? <laughs> The people led by him. Yeah, people led by him. <laughs> It's a weird. I still can't influenced by him. Yeah, right. So,、um, and the third one is racial supremacy. Okay, we're getting kind of dicey here, Sherry, <laughs> on these. <laughs> But ironically, this article is arguing. You know, obviously, is is talking well, about how Germany. Well, when you start from the position of number one, it's not China. Then you can it can look a lot like China. Oh yeah, I know. I'm like,、yeah. are you reading this? Yeah. The thing that you wrote. Um, yeah, so、um, racial supremacy, but no, no, no. China's not that. China's fifty-six flowers, all shining and 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 thriving in the same garden. Okay, so yeah, racial supremacy. All this, yeah.、Um, and then the last one, the fifth one, is authoritarianism,、um, is and and reverence, reverence, reverence of action and the effectiveness of violence. Okay. Meaning that nothing else works, and you have to grab the power, and power breeds power. <laughs> Okay, so basically, and that's she, that's that's really all what that matters. So Tiananmen Square, Xi Jinping, anti-corruption, anti-corruption campaign. campaign. Yeah, concentrate like you know, like the concentration <laughs> of power. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. So okay, it's like House of Cards. Power is power. So <laughs> yeah, that's exactly I think what we believe. Yeah. Right. So I mean, sometimes almost almost on paper, almost like in propaganda. Yeah. You see this argument of. You know, it, it, might mix right. Yeah, exactly. And that is interesting. Sort of the the trajectory of how the party convinces the people for the past thirty years,、mm-hmm. where the very dramatic growth of economy, yeah, right, justifies the、um, the, the 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 rule of the party, yeah, which is like, well, you know, we we had we we performed this, and you know, it was it was a lot of action, <laughs> positive action, economically speaking, and therefore it's like the.、Uh... It's like the beatings will continue until the economy improves. Yes. Like all of this crackdown and and、uh, stuff. Yeah. It gets results. 
right? Oh, yeah. So that's and that's what, that's what matters. That's what matters. And the worst thing that could happen is to have a political body that does not deliver results, mm. that is slow, like a democracy would be, yeah. that is inefficient, like a democracy would be, um, you know, that is... Uh, yeah, you me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... So by Chinese definition... Yeah. Even though the first thing we say is definitely not us, <laughs> definitely just those three countries. It's very simplified simplified um yeah state uh, version of it um so okay well by that definition about it, yeah. it's kind of like eh. okay well so i'd say by that definition the chinese government would be fascist yes their and own this, definition and this paper because it's a discussion of journalism system of fascism how mm -hmm. it aided and it also fascism loves censored censored press oh. fascism censors press okay yeah 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 which the... what are we doing <laughs> when was this written not that long ago, 2018, September 6th. Okay. Well, so, okay. So, uh, from that depth, from the, <laughs> from the sort of simplistic, and again, you know, you're, you're translating it. So yeah, I'm translating this on the, on the fly. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. Okay. But still, it, it looks kind of alarmingly close <laughs> to reality. Um, okay. So I guess final points, fascism, in my opinion, can't really truly be channeled. Uh, it is a revolutionary and society destroying ideology if it is not purged. So I think people in a way, when you call a racist police department mm -hmm. or authoritarian government fascism and it's not, you're really underselling fascism, mm. right? You're really making fascism just seem like thugs and secret police and, you know, bad people and racism. Okay. When it's really, it's much worse than, worse than that in a way yeah. because it's not like oh take your society and make it worse and crueler fascist party is in power it's going to destroy your society mm. it's going to reorganize your society as an engine for war sounds right like, sounds like mouse brand of communism well, exactly right <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and communism in some ways it's just uprooting society for something else yes it's yeah. revolutionary right it's mm -hmm. not reactionary yeah. from most definition the marxist definition is that it's reactionary sure if it's literal fascism it can't really be bargained with because they're not rational actors no. yeah you can make deals with them but but they're going to betray you right <laughs> because yeah. in the end you don't matter yeah. right you're not people to them you're you're outside the race you're outside the nation yeah and they believe that if they believe hard enough yeah they're gonna they're gonna win right yeah so you might give up certain things that you were doing already yes um and china as a country right now like you know all the trade war stuff that was going on yeah. and relies china relies heavily on globalization no matter what we say that's just a fact yes and china cannot survive or the the, the party in power cannot survive yes the grab you know of the power and again when you say it's the grip on the power sorry yeah and when you say it's like fascism you're basically saying well the only option is to start a war Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you have. We have. To, Some may say that is right, the only option. You, know, you have to go yeah. in there, crush it. Yeah. And do a regime change. Yeah. And, and maybe in the grand scheme of things, you know, no amount of trade negotiations or human rights will ever make anything better for anyone. Mm -hmm. Like a Uyghur in a in a camp getting, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to kind of realistically look at what China is, and I just I don't think it's I don't think it's fascist. I just it's yeah. just and it's an authoritarian. Yeah. State, it might be a racist authoritarian ethno state, yeah. uh, as we recently saw yet another round of blackface on the yeah. Chinese uh, New Year's celebration video, Lunar New Year. Yeah. Um, but but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean it's fascism and yeah. it means your it's strategy not... for dealing with it has to be based on reality. Yes. And China's not an ethno state, it's just trying to be one. Well very it, it seems was very like it is terrible to... yeah. um, you know, methods and, and cruel policies yeah um yeah but the other thing about fascism is like if you like you know if you brand them as fascism then the whole nation is an enemy yeah. because that's who they are and you ignore the people inside of it that are also victims this again this isn't to this isn't to defend the the communist party but i just i feel like if your if your concern is what they're doing on the world stage or um, at home or at home to people then you have to look at them realistically and their actions and I, you have to understand what kind of what kind of beast you're dealing with right what kind of entity yeah. you're trying to negotiate with yeah and if you just 
go back as fascist then it's like well, then, you know. yeah so the lesson is what don't look away <laughs> don't look away right yeah. don't just give it a convenient label in my opinion yeah. um well anyway yeah. hopefully that was interesting to people i know mm-hmm. uh we kind of have got off the rails a little bit yeah but um not fascism china Nazi, it does come up a lot you see it a lot and i again i do think it matters yeah whether or not a country it's fascist and that sounds kind of ridiculous of course it matters right that's like yeah but you know but the accuracy of the label the accuracy of the label between two it's more negative than just, labels is important it's more than just academic in my opinion mm, okay uh well that was our episode for today um feel free to send us angry dms on twitter and i uh, <laughs> hope everyone's having a nice weekend yeah and have a nice day see you next time <laughs>